Hi, I'm Prophet Nati. Thanks for listening to the Caribbean Cannabis Channel. Meditate with us every Monday as we seek to educate you on the latest developments and personal stories of those shaping the cannabis economy across the region. Now here's your program. So welcome back to the Caribbean Cannabis Channel, everyone. That was a pleasure having our different guests from across the Caribbean region sharing their insights, their own personal stories. Today we have a beautiful young woman all the way from Jamaica joining us. She's a cannabis advocate, educator, a businesswoman, and a grassroots woman involved in the industry. So, Kitty, how are you doing today? Good morning, or good afternoon, or good night, wherever you are listening. I'm doing very well. That's good to hear, that's good to hear. How, how is the weather treating you all in Jamaica? I know anytime when it's coming on close to Christmas, um, the times that I've been in Jamaica, it's been very cool. So how, how is it there? Very cool. <laughs> it's been very cool. <laughs> Uh, I'm a little jealous of you because here the, the weather fluctuates so much, but it's either very hot, which it is right now, or very cold. Yeah, it warms in the day, but most places, if you're in the valleys, mm-hmm. it'll be a little bit hotter than you're in the mountains. Okay, okay, nice, nice. Well, I hear the birds chirping by you, so uh, good weather there, I guess. Then. <laughs> yeah, I have lots of birds around, which is a blessing. Always. So, so Katie, I know that everyone who's involved in the cannabis industry has their own story about how they got involved in it. So just share a little bit about how you actually got involved in cannabis and whether you were a user or it just sparked your interest at a point in your life. Well, I've been introduced, to, I've been in cannabis now for like 30 years. And um, I've been, I was, I was at the table when we started um, the conversation in Jamaica back in the 90s and then in the 2000 era. So I am originally from the mountains, but my family has hotels on the coast. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a mixture of both worlds. You you, you, you get to interact with all nationalities from the hotel industry. And you're from the mountains, so you have, you're from the mountains, the cockpit country where the marrows, where freedom fighting really begin in, in Jamaica somewhat, right? So within the, the, the maroon space, because I'm a maroon and within the maroon space, between the, when the treaty was signed, the 6th of January coming is another, added, added year to the treaty between the maroons and the British government. So within that space, every year on the 6th of January, cannabis was liberally used within this space. So every 6th of January, you have the head of, head of all different divisions in government, so the governor general, the prime minister, opposition, minister of tourism, culture, whatever, you name it, would meet to honor this tradition for, for, for years now, for 100 years now. So now you would see cannabis just... Everybody had cannabis walking around, meaning that, and that was, and, and, and since the seventies, forties, thirties, going as way back, you had, Jamaica had a relationship with cannabis, ganja, as we call it. And we have never been shy as a country or as a people about cannabis, never. So due to that now, where is it planted? It's illegal. It's a part of, it's a heavy part. It's a heavy, it's heavily in our culture in our medicine, in everything that we do. So, and it was illegal. The fines were awful. Years of possession, dealing, whatever. So how could you, who, how, who would be really growing cannabis? The people who live in the mountains. And I'm from the mountains. So I grew up around a lot of Rasta men, um, a lot of non-Rastas, what we call in Jamaica, bald head, who would be Growing cannabis, right? So my family are landowners and people used to go on my grandfather. He used to have like fruits, lumbers, pimento. Those were his major crop as a farming family. And those are seasonal crops. So people in between would go over, you probably have a hundred years here. Some rest that go over there and plant some herb because 
we're not going to call police. My grandfather, my great grandfather wouldn't call police and he was on the back. It's wooded. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. So these were the spaces people could cultivate cannabis. And these were the spaces that I was born in. So as a young lady at 17, 16, you have summer jobs. So where would I go for summer jobs? Down to Montego Bay at my, my aunt's place. Being at that hotel, being in the tourist industry in that time, because I'm 49 now, so I'm talking about the younger days uh, when High Times, Deep Magazine like High Times was just touching the road. You see what I mean? So I was in the tourist, and that was when in the 70s, when cannabis, when planes were a because cannabis saved Jamaica life already now. History shows that plane load, we even have songs about it, we have poems about it. So having seen cannabis in the mountains, now I'm in the, I'm, a, I'm a, at the coast where you have people coming in from all over the, all over the world. That was when the Vietnam War drug was, the whole drug culture, the whole awareness, the whole hippie vibes, mushrooms, all of those things were happening in North America. So of course, being in a tourist area, so I get to interact with a lot of white hippies who are really taking cannabis serious. Who I never, I didn't even know that they, I saw one day I saw a book in one of the room. A housekeeping, a lady in housekeeping didn't come to work. So of course, you are the high school student coming down for the summer job and it's your family's hotel. You are going to be flexed all around. Housekeeping, kitchen, you know, you're gaining skills. So I went into a room, I was doing housekeeping this week, and I went in there and I saw a, a High Times magazine, one of the earlier issues there. And it was one of the greats of cannabis was staying at the hotel, now that I knew. And um we started, I, I, I wasn't allowed to talk to the guests because, you know, the parents and everything, you're not allowed to talk to the guests. You're a 17 year old young girl in the Caribbean working at the hotel. They are going, you know, you don't want that interruption. However, I, 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 I keep watching this, this man. He's an older man. He's probably about 40 at the time. Or, and he's older. So I was watching him. So when I got the opportunity to ask him about this magazine, which was the High Times magazine, that was when my eye was like, what? This is happening in America with cannabis? With the ganja today? So I was so anxious to carry that information and go back to the mountains. You can imagine. I saw the first official, let me say, document on cannabis. There's a High Times magazine. So I said to the guy, the elder, the, the white guy, there's a lot of cannabis in my mountains, you know? Oh, no, 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 you know? And he was like, yeah. And he gave me a full lecture of what today would be like. A full lecture. And uh, he gave me magazines. He gave me a book. He gave me a, a, a hemp bag. So I went up to the mountains now. Holiday, summer holidays over. We're going back to the mountains, right? So now in the mountains, Rasta was a big thing in those days. So I was like, yo, you know that there's a ganja book and a magazine? And <laughs> these guys were really interested because these guys work for my grandparents. Some of them, some of them are neighbors, you know, just coming to the just small coming. Mm-hmm. All right, so that's when I started to say, no. So after leaving high school, I was always, I was reading more and more and more and more because, you know, I have family abroad, you never have Amazon, you never have the information, the internet of information as what we have now. So, you know, you have to source, right? So I would source my cousin's book in California. So get me the High Times book. All right, so I wrote a letter to them, asking if I could get to a magazine monthly. And they said, yes, I'm a cousin paid for it. And that was the beginning. I've never turned back. So what I did with all of those information, and that was before we were feminizing seeds. So like Ed Rooms and Tal, who's one of the famous writers of cannabis books that are used in, in, in Amsterdam University. He was the editor. Repeat the name for me. Ed Rosenthal. Ed Rosenthal, okay. Right. He, he, he writes a lot of cannabis books that he's using. In, in Oaksterdam University in California, which is like a cannabis university, right? Like cannabis. Yeah, I'm familiar with them. Yeah, one of the first cannabis institutes. So he's one of the major writers of the books. You have other people who come younger, but as old guys, those guys, and some other old guys, I can't remember the, their names now, but that's where I started seeing their feminizing seed. 
Amsterdam was running greenhouse seeds, Tennessee Seed Bank. It was in high times, it was Axe Ed, who was the editor for the growers side. You'd see extraction, other auxiliary to the industry started to build out in the world. Then you'd see you can get all feminized seeds. After leaving high school, went to college, was still looking at cannabis. Because of my family and the Christian background and church, I never took part, you know what I mean? Never took part. Or too familiar. Yeah. So after, during high school now, because remember, I'm from the mountains, right? During high school now, some of my friends just stopped going to high school and gone to plant cannabis full time. And they were like building houses, driving cars. But they were farmers. They plant other things too. Nobody really ever used to plant cannabis alone. It was intercropping, right? And I was like, yo, this can change the economics of our place, you know? This can make poor people have opportunity and stuff. So we really start look at the economic value. Then we start have conversation with um, people who were in the university who was looking at the cannabis, like, behind the scene. You, you, I have a cousin that got to you, and you would tell me, and he tell me that they're doing some little research up there. I go in there, hang around the lab and see if I can talk to that person or whatever. And then after high, after finishing that, I went to work in the bauxite industry. Keep working in my family's um, industries. Because in my family, girls really don't work outside of the family industries for protection. They are in the Caribbean. You all right? <laughs> so, that, that was like a way, a method of giving us some kind of protection. So we only work for a while only in our family's industries, which is like supermarkets, restaurants hotels, you know, small insurance brokers or whatever it is, mm-hmm. workshops, garage and all that. So then I went, then after, during college, you know, I started to get serious because I'm so independent. And, you know, when you start working from summer, summer job, you get independent, you understand your own money. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to get some, I'll plant some guns on me and them guys are friends. They're in the mountains, they're on my parents' property. So... You know what I mean? Might as well. So I would hide them. I would hide them out and invest. Like give them buckets or barrels, especially barrels, because I have a big family. So you have most of them live in North America. You know, every summer the barrel and the Christmas the barrel comes. <laughs> so I would I give them those barrels because they're just throw, going to throw them out anyway. Especially the paper ones. Yeah, make better use of them. Because I was reading these books. I knew how to how to do a lot of stuff. Then um, of course, I went to, after, after, I went into agriculture, started farming for the hotel industry, pineapples, cabbage, all of those stuff, as an entrepreneur, as a young entrepreneur, with my day job too. And I remember one year, there was a hurricane and I lost everything, and I remember one season too, everything was like for $10. I said, no, 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 when cannabis was selling for like, probably $1,000 a pound, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, of course, I went over into the illegal space. But remember, I'm like 20, 25, 26 now, and I'm in the illegal space. The illegal space. But I was in there collecting data, most of all. Because I knew what, I had people who were advanced money, people from Washington. So when Washington State started to legalize, I was on board. When California was, there were 99 plants that was on board. So when Jamaica was in 2015, and I, and I did work with it. Um, a professor in university he wrote a book, the Commission on Gun Traffic book, and I was there too. Um, but just in the background, you know, because, you know. So what I do, do, do now is I, when I read these books and I did the agriculture or something, I would like go to my friends at UA. I say, yo, what, what does this mean? How do we get this done? How do you do the tissue culture? How do you do all of that? You know? And like come combine traditional knowledge with you know science and technology mm-hmm. to produce something. So I was like, yeah. And of course, I have I had a boyfriend at the time who would be the front runner because you know my parents I thought I have to be hiding doing this thing, right? <laughs> but I would, I would be writing down everything when it when I drop the scene, everything, everything, and then I would try to as an engineer I would try to um that's what I did in high school and college. I would try to um. You know, just some little stuff to get better growth, better working environment, everything. Understand the technicalities. Yes. So I became a master grower through that. So after when Jamaica started in 2015, I mean, I have land. I have, uh, we can get funding if necessary. 
it's, it's illegal now. I have an argument for my parents and my family. It's legal now, so you can't say no, whatever. And at this time, 2015, I had grown in the mountains, I've grown in the Maras, I've grown in very dry, dry areas of Jamaica. I've gone overseas, a certain stuff happening, how they be working indoors and all of that. So when 2015, I stepped out there and said, well, I'm going to consult this industry. Why? Because I had all of these white guys, I was watching their industry, I was seeing what was happening in Washington. You want it to happen to the Caribbean, know that I know what I know about it. So I stepped out and I said, oh, I'll consult. So I started to organize the, the parish. The parishes, you have what? 14 parishes, probably 13. Kingston and St. Andrew is almost like one. And I helped to organize about 11 of those parishes. Wow. So for awareness, then I started to be involved heavily in the, in the discussion, the regulation. And so I became the queen of cannabis in Jamaica. <laughs> Just working with everybody doing consultancy. Then I switched over into going international because at the same time, South Africa was doing the same thing, trying to do the same thing. You remember in 2015, South Africa, you know, was trying to do the same thing. Right, right. The true family connection in Europe, I decided that I am going to go to South Africa. So I reached out to South Africa, find another woman like me who was heavily involved with government and consultation and advocacy and education and everything. And then we convinced our board governments, we position ourselves and convince board government to add a, a bilateral around the cannabis. And they added the other things to it. That bilateral brought me over to working with indigenous people because I was here working, remember, 11 parishes. I was in the organization of some of these parishes. That turns into a definite national advocate, right? Correct. They just get able to help make the rules and regulation. So that I had that under my belt to trad now internationally, right? So I get to South Africa, start share information, start work. I went down to South Africa, start work with the indigenous tribes of South Africa, different, different. But it was through a company that was well established, well positioned, and a farm partnership. And then I started to go along the thread of indigenous knowledge, IKS systems and holders through cannabis. So that led me to Panama, Colombia, other countries, and back to the Indians in America, observing what they're doing, that like the Indians of California, mm-hmm. what they would be doing, and the whole, and how it all plays out. Then I came back to Jamaica, back in Jamaica, back and forth here, sitting back now, Help, well, I've always been helping small, small girls how to get into the industry. Helping people to know where to position themselves because government, you know, it's a, it's a hard struggle to, to get government to do what any one group wants it to do, but you need to be, have a seat at the table. Correct. So I work closely with the Cannabis Licensing Authority, with GGPA, National Coalition. We work for all of these small groups. I worked closely with them, we had a cannabis show here, high times, we worked closely with that as well. Um, so in 2021 now, with COVID, things have kind of pivoted a little bit, but we are still moving ahead because the industry is still moving ahead. So you have, then you have other islands can, um, having the conversation as well. So other Jamaicans within the space will go over to these islands as well. I went to Africa. And then now, with, with that now, we were able to identify knowledge-based holders and how cannabis, and then we, I, did, I was involved in a, a, a kind of research that we still, we haven't concluded how cannabis impact traditional people, like the, the poker people, the obia people, the voodoo people, the dancehall people, mm-hmm. all of these. Because, I don't know, in Jamaica, you know, you have curry goat and manish water. I realize that a lot of people put a little herb in the manish water. They use, they put it with the rum for pain. They put it, how it's used, with different groups use it, you know what I mean? And with that kind of background, I was able to take on the IKS system, which is Indigenous Knowledge Based Systems, and how Indigenous people. So my, where I am now is giving strength and whatever I know as a language. 
in terms of the cannabis language. They know cannabis has its own language in every language. Yeah. You know? Yeah, right. So you want to have that kind of conversation at that level. So my mantra right now is traditional knowledge plus science and technology technology for commercialization. So this is where that is my scope of what I'm doing now. How can I use the traditional? Because we just finish up the ASTM standards of cannabis, which is a standard body below ISO, right? It's D37, I think, is it, if you look on ASTM. So they are really the standard body that is looking at cannabis across the world. So they are in South Africa standardizing. They did some work in Jamaica, all over. Those standard standards that, that it comes out of ASTM are contributed by stakeholders within the industry. Okay. But what we need to do as a people is to get our traditional non, um, standards, our traditional knowledge, and how systems, our traditional systems that be standardized. So our idols, the way we, we convert, the way we use grass as a mulch, as a, a cooling agent for the earth. Or how we use, we need to get these things by engaging the universities, other institutions, and get it to be standardized as a part of the standards. Or how we would move, because if we don't have standards, we don't really have commercialization. This is the 21st century. The other thing I'm looking at is that the cannabis industry has not moved because of the corresponding banking issue. Worldwide, the finance of the world is going into cryptocurrency, blockchain technology. Cannabis industry should be seriously in the Caribbean looking at that and not sitting down and waiting and corresponding a centralized system, but a decentralized system. So the young men like you, who you call me young lady, I'm calling you young men of the Caribbean. <laughs> Putting in, that's what I want to do. Put traditional knowledge with science and technology, science and technology for commercialization using AI technology, blockchain technology, crypto knowledge. So we can move the industry. Because if we don't add the technology to it, we're not going to move like the, in the oil industry or any of these industry. Technology and access benefit sharing, IP. All of these four pieces is what will make the industry mean something to people of color, children of slavery, not slaves, children of slavery, to really take part at that level that what Europe is doing with cannabis, what North America is doing with cannabis. Because North America is such a hypocrite. The states are legalized, but federal it's not. Yet we are federal. We are, we are federal in Jamaica because, I mean, it's not a parish by parish. It's a national thing. So, look at what Europe is doing. So, if we don't position ourselves on the technology path with cannabis, right, with our IPs, protect what is us, what is unique to us. We can't go into industrial hemp. We don't have the landmass. We don't have the money for the, the capital for that kind of equipment. But we can have cottage industries like tourism, not tourism of cannabis in a, a, in a hill town. But Trinidad and Jamaica, a Jamaican who this is his island, he has a uniqueness, he has his IP set, and he can take part at that level. You understand what I'm saying? Because what they have always done is to commercialize our activity, and then we don't take part economically, like what happened to the Rastas with Sacrament. Correct. And how you can take part, but you can be commercialized. But in South Africa, they are having a good conversation where the rest of the community is concerned. We, as from academic to governance, to advocates, to farmers, we as a country, as a Caribbean, must have a direct path of what do we want out of this industry. Are we building a niche industry? Are we building, we must look from the brand. What is the brand? That probably don't have space for, you can't compete with China, India, South Africa. And industrial hemp to make clothes, rubbish. You do anything. You know what I'm saying? Look at recreational cannabis before we look at industrialization of making byproducts of. You know what I mean? Look at edibles. Set the standards for edible. Set the rules for edible. Right? Because it can happen. I don't see why People in, in Colorado can have an edible industry, but people in Jamaica can't have an edible industry. 
you have the same mouth. Yeah, I saw that um in Jamaica they don't have um they don't really advertise edibles or anything. All right, the thing about edibles now, ed- edibles can't just work like flowers or so because edibles you know edibles eating. So if you don't have all right before back up before we reach there, what kind of industry does Jamaica have? We decriminalize, we never legalize. We decriminalize and we set up a medical yeah. regulation. Right. In a medical regu- regulation, doctors get the free fall. Right? In a edible industry, a recreational industry, more people are able to take part. So the government will never end up with more money. But it's more high risk. Because science and technology have to driven, have to, have to be driven by that because safety, food safety. True. Yeah, so yeah, agreed. So you can't have a you have to have um special containers, you have to have but to the to, to the wire telling the people that oh we can have edibles but you have to have every single cookie is two point five THC. Every single cookie. You're asking us to do something scientific to reap a benefit. Rubbish. What we want to do is say, all right, let's have five, two to five percent kids, right? And have an educational program. Teach people how to microdose. Ah, why? Doctors teach us to microdose. When you go to the doctor, when some people go to the doctor have diabetes, they give you one tablet and say, cut it in four and take a quarter. True, true. When my, when my grandmother cut it in four, it's not four equal parts. She don't have a laser, she have a pretty knife. So she's still estimating things. Right. So we need to have a conversation of informed, of informed people, just like the license. This is something I don't want other countries to do. I hope for them to look at Jamaica's situation. We have five licenses in Jamaica, but you have the tiers, the tiers, the amount is a tier to license the activity. So you have transportation, Research and development, dispensary, herb host, cultivation, processing fix. You can't give a company all five licenses. This is not wise. Let's say you can't, but they do it. It's not wise for everybody to get because you have the money and the warehouse to get all five licenses. Monopolize, monopolize this situation. Over time. Not immediately now. Because it's such something that is so attractive and we know the money that's behind it. The money is, uh, is behind it if these possibilities are, 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 are achieved. So you have five different licenses and you have one company have grow license. All of these big companies come down and they have these big licenses. So me you now who I work in cannabis for 30 years and I work with everybody and I say, oh, I never applied for a license. My first can probably say 5,000 US dollars. And give me, I can defer all my fees because the you can have this license not a you are able to defer all your fees if necessary, right? Mm-hmm. And all of that. But when, when, the only time I'm gonna sell my one acre flowers is when these big boys don't have any. And if they have a good system with the money that they have, what am I going to sell it to? But they, they have the dispensary, they have a grow license. So they are going for their dispensary. And because it's a closed loop system we have in Jamaica, you cannot sell it outside of the licensed people. Because according to our agreement and signatories, signatories to the United Treaty, and because we are decriminalized, we can't sell it to any anybody. So I have to sell all of my flowers to a dispensary. So when I, when the dispensary is going to have me by the balls, because he has a grow license. So what you have to do is separate the, the regulatory body. It's not only to regulate that you don't break the rule, but it's to regulate how the industry is going to develop. Right. So we have to stick those in two. Oh, we are just regulators. We regulate that you don't break the law so we don't get into any sanctions and this stuff. You are also a regulator to develop it wisely. Make sure it's impacting everyone involved in the industry and not just that, that one person. So you're going to get a lot of grumbling. It's going to get, it's going to get like what happened. It's going to get weak. That 
some people is not seeing their bottom So why? Is that? A, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of farmers I know who was willing and hot to work in cannabis industry is stepping back because they can't sell. The cost is expensive, and the cost is expensive everywhere. And the rules of cannabis has to be according to what the rule of the world is. It's a, it's a control substance. You get me? So people ask sometimes ask the things that is not possible. You have to work with government on what is possible and try to change things as a go along. Not changing people's attitude, but only changing policies. True. So that's where the change from, you know? And if somebody give me a, a tap on the shoulder, you know what I'm saying? It's the policy that you, 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 you know, that you have in the air. That's what is really going to affect me and my generation to come. So really and truly, I think the licensing, the regulators, yes, they are regulators. So that they shouldn't be looking business for you, right? But the regulators must have a plan how to develop the industry in a meaningful way. And it's going to come from how the regulation is and how the regulation and how the industry is this is distributed to the populace. So we have to, uh, what I would wish, and uh, this is my wish list, I don't know if, if I can wish, but I would wish, <laughs> if the bigger companies would stay with processing and looking overseas, man. Leave the growing to the small man. If they're not going to your standards, invest in their standards. Them. Hold them a company. Right. Invest in, I would happily invest into 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 some farmers and giving them standards developing because you you can't expect somebody who used to hide in the bush and have to push the cannabis around at the back of the latch entirely and over the rocks in the rock stone hole tied up in the tree to hide to have a standard of how it's going to have like a harvest after eating. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, how, right, so you do a little education. We must invest in the industry that we want to be free from. And this is our problem as a, as a country, as a, as a Caribbean people, right? And we must have this Caribbean conversation. And if, if, if we don't see that Europe works together, North America, South America, you understand they work together, the Caribbean people have to work together because guess what? If you really take it and check it, you know, you have the brand of the world where cannabis is concerned. And brand is where it is. Yeah, eh? if don't hear this, wanna come, if don't hear this, wanna come to experience, experience cannabis in, in its full entirety. Yes, and because we are, we are, we are on the equator, we are perfect. We have good weather to grow all around. We can actually use the technology and go solar and grow. And so you get about, you know what I'm saying? You can go. You guys have a probably a little bit of advantage if you're, if you're growing in a greenhouse settings with if you're using a lot of power. Your electricity bill probably cheaper than us, but our space is probably bigger than yours. Our market is probably bigger than yours. So you don't have to know where in the space they want to go. You understand? Know True, fill the gap. Because it's not the same. It's not the same. You know what I mean? You can find five colleagues or some are back and we got seen about cannabis. But you can you can play Gaja reggae song from now till tomorrow next year. You know what I mean? It's a lot of it's a cultural thing in Jamaica. So Jamaica have to rely on selling its branded culture that they already brand plus standards plus tourism and apps for recreational. So we can really share the wealth of cannabis across. And then again we need to educate our people how to use cannabis. That is so important, especially our elders. But they are the biggest demo in the world that, that use cannabis to be exact. You be surprised. True, but they, they hide it. The amount of information and your experience that you have shared, the insight, like I've been so in, engrossed by it because your, your, your story and what you are doing now is probably one of the most interesting stories that I, I've covered. And... What I love that what you're referring to is incorporating both the traditional um, aspect of how persons has dealt with cannabis, as well as now utilizing technology, which is very important. And I think a lot of persons, especially in, in the region, because many of us are still conservative, we want to only solely focus on the traditional aspect and try to reserve um, our IPs and the patents, which is important. But we also need that technological education, that investment as well, so that we can 
get past the different layers of the cannabis industry. And you would have rightfully said that um, across the region, one person may be able to fulfill a certain um, thing within the industry and help another country. And we need to get more of that going. It's not just in cannabis where we need to work together, but also in other parts of, of our development. Because we have a lot of similarities, um, a few differences, but we have to more so work on how we can alleviate those differences and fill it with um, how we can actually benefit benefit each other. So what I want to understand though, in terms of which part Jamaica is at right now, well, what are the, the plans that the government has outlaid in terms of moving the industry forward? Is it solely right now only medical or they, have they actually started those discussions in terms of expanding the industry past um, only medical and just sacrament used for for the Rastafarians alone? Well, our, our, our regulators are always working. And they're always getting bashed, but they're always working. <laughs> always working. So, because you have to, you can't bully government. You can't bully regulators. You work with them. Smart. You show them why it is important. And this is where we need to do from grassroots. Because when regulators go to the field, they're bullied. And these are our people working with those our people. But we have to not bully the regulators. So, for example, Cannabis Licensing Authority in Jamaica is trying to get the, 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 the traditional growers to enter at a lower barrier, meaning that to defer the fees, they, are, they have a transitional permit where you can come in and but you can grow, but you're not processing that. Little things that, you know, that is a amendment to the regulation that is here because our, our, even though we start from such a long time, our regulator, our regulation are still at the interim stage. You know what I mean? It's not complete steel and sign. It's still developing. All right. The other part again, too, that, that is happening in Jamaica, they are having a conversation about commercialization and Rockstar, not just Sacrament. So that conversation is being had. And yeah, it got through the Ministry of Justice and the regulators and other, other, other governing body, right? So they, the, the Rasta community, has been the ear of the Minister of Justice because the Minister of Justice in Jamaica is really responsible for the sacrament part of it. It's not a, it's not regulated by CLA because CLA is the governing body of regulators. Okay. But for sacrament, for, uh, for special events around cannabis, for the rest of sacrament, the rest of our community, community, it definitely goes through the Ministry of Justice. But it was first put on the table and the first amendment to the Dangerous Drug Act. There wasn't a follow-up, so to speak. There was a fallback between the relationship of the Ministry of Justice and the Rastas. So the, the, the Ministry of Justice and the Rastas have gone back to the table because they see that sacrament need more than, you know, more than just sacrament. I mean, grape wine is sacrament. But when you buy it in the supermarket, it's not sacrament. Or when you carry it into the church yeah, and the blessing and the Lord's sacrament, let's not go around these things because we also need to have brutally frank conversations. Agreed. You yeah, understand? We need that too, especially as black people. We have learned for hundreds of years how to talk around things and not truly express who we are because we don't want to say we are forceful or we are this or that. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So we have to have Forceful, unpleasant conversation. Better yet, conversation. All right? So the Rastas need to get back to something. They need to get back to, to commercialize or to have a plan how to how they'll make money from the in this industry than just to have it as a sacrament or recognize. But it's a recognition. It's not a giving. It's a recognition. The other thing that is happening in Jamaica, apart from those two, we are still... And the, and the hanging of corresponding banking. And if corresponding banking does not recognize cannabis, we cannot have investment. It's hard to invest. So if a company like, say, chips, any chip like Pringles want to go into cannabis, we probably can't because the bank account, their whole business is going to be stuck because they are in a system that is not recognized. You know, you know how money works. Money runs things, right? Mm-hmm. And if you can get back, if you can get funding from banks or something, where are you going to get the money from? This is why we need to use blockchain and cryptocurrency to run this industry and and uh, 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 decentralize the life 
So I just I really yes, I feel like on the cash on the cash system. And the fear that is feeling, right? And 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 fear um fintech is just a part of that big system, right? So that's one. The other thing again, um, so that so the banking system still have way at 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 chokehold in the Carib in Jamaica. The CLA is working hard for the for the for the the smaller farmers or the the poorer farmers to involve to get into the industry. The CLA is exporting; they are facilitating exporting because our export. Our export policy document is not complete, seal and signed. But they, if you are in Jamaica, you can, and with all your standards and, and Trinidad require that I send them some cannabis from my license place and I get everything clearly will accommodate me to export to Trinidad. But yes, you see, a couple of months ago, we sent seeds to St. Vincent. Okay, I saw that, and I also saw that, um, it had an export into Australia recently. Right, yes. And we had an export into Germany. The thing about it is that those European countries will only take, if you are under certain EU standards, which is the roughest standard body for any product or services, right? Mm-hmm. So we the Caribbean, if you have a factory down there and you want to get it standardized at EU standards, you'd have to fly in these um, standards, people, these uh, quality managers and stuff. It's very expensive. So... We have the Bureau of Standards here. Who is our standard body nationally? And you have the Science Research Council. So they are, I think, the minister, and they are looking at um, empowering these bodies. We need we need labs in the Caribbean. So that's what is happening in Jamaica. So it's still a struggle. And with COVID, guys, everything goes to the Ministry of Health as well. So we have probably about 60 products that is approved by the Ministry of Health as cannabis product. It can be exported or can be used and all of that. But we need to have a Caribbean region. And my Caribbean region is Jamaica Grow, Trinidad Process. So we need some processing plants in Trinidad to extract. Because you have a bit, you have a, um, you're you cheaper on electricity than us. You see what I mean? And then we sell to Europe. Instead so that you get a Jamaica, you can get a Jamaica. It's like us. It cannot be, it's like people. So we're supposed to represent the world like us. So, you know, in America, anywhere in Europe, he's a Caribbean man. You know, come from Trinidad. He's a Caribbean girl. You know, come from Jamaica. So, so we want to have, you know, some cannabis like that. So, if all the Caribbean have whatever, I would do it like that. I would have the manufacturing there. We are growing in Guyana. Bigger islands. You grow in Cuba. You grow, they have space. And of course, you have some countries have better brand than others, you know. But the Grenada brand could be there. The St. Vincent brand could be there. The Trinidad brand could be there. You get me? Yeah, that was. And you have the yeah. So that's what we want to do, and then we sell to Africa. That Africa is the market for us. Why? Just like how the China can look to Africa as a market, we have to look for Africa as our market. Africa is the market. So you have. Where I am, where I am in Durban, where my, where the facility that I am in Durban, is eight million people living in that city. You don't even have eight million people in Jamaica. Much more Trinidad. Two. Two. <laughs> so what I mean? More facility so, there. So me, am, yeah. So me, I make one ganja soap. What's the odds of me selling it to five million people, four million people, five million people in Jamaica? Then the odds of me selling it now one city. In a one country, we have 8 million people. Do the maths. It pans out better, definitely. Of course. And I don't even have to manufacture it there, here. And they ship it across. That, that sounds true. Yeah, and what you do? You go to South America, you don't even have to go to Europe and trip like how they give us that route. Yeah, so and Panama is the hub. Direct to Panama. Got Panama just finish up their thing now, you know. But question though, see, that's how... You have been working with governments and different communities, not just in Jamaica, but on an international level. Um, in terms of, I know that they would have done the Marijuana Commission in 2018. But from, from my understanding, yeah. I do think I've, I've seen that they've tried to incorporate CSME or in, introduce cannabis into the CSME market. Have you all done any discussions with that in terms of exporting and importing cannabis through the CSME? That's the Caribbean's. The CSM is um, the Caribbean single market economy. 
So uh, that's where they. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. Chairman Monkey. Yeah, all right. I think there's a discussion being had. Because if you notice, the regulation and the people who are helping the other Caribbean people are, are Caribbean people. Correct. Look at Marshall, Dr. Marshall, Emmanuel Marshall, right? He's a, he's a Caribbean man. He lives in Jamaica, but he's from the islands. He's from, I think, St. Lucia, St. One of these small islands, right? Smaller islands. <laughs> so, I think there is a discussion. There was a white paper that was done on that. But uh, since 20, I think it was Scares. Scares was the company. Scares. I send you the links so you can look into that and have a conversation with those, with those, with those, um, rest of you, right? That. Those rest, Kadama, Dr. Kadama, we knife, Marshall, some of those papers. Um, yes, there was a conversation, but we can only export when the receiving country. Yeah, the industry up and running. It, according to the, international bodies, right? Right. So, we can only export. So, if your country regulation is alright and you get all of your correct paperwork, there's no issue for us to send. The issue of what they're going to charge us for transporting, if we're going to get the free market, like, you know, mm-hmm. you know, it's not like, that's another thing. The standards is another thing. Although there's an international standard, so therefore we can go by that. But there's, I think there was a shipment to Cayman before, from here as well. It was in the paper some years ago, like during this time, uh, since 2015 with the legalization, there has been to Cayman, there was something to, um, even, even Paraguay. Okay. Or uh, Uruguay, Uruguay. Probably Uruguay, yeah, no Uruguay, it's fully legal, so. Right, we had shipment to there, we had shipment to Colombia, we had shipment from Jamaica to Zimbabwe, we had shipment to, you know, South Africa, we had shipment to Australia. It's not everything that is publicized that, you know, but in, in, in conversation and workshops or so, we get a briefing on where, which country, and we're not having the, the conversation of Israel in the Caribbean with cannabis, but the Israelis are way advanced. They're the most advanced country with cannabis. Yeah, I've been seeing the work they've been doing on it. And they're all over the thing. Yeah. yeah, Israel is really advanced in cannabis. And they are working They are working here in Jamaica. You have companies that are related to Israeli cannabis industry that are here as well. And, and probably bringing over some of the technologies. And they have a very good agriculture. Uh, agri um industry in, in Israel, you know, they produce a lot of food in the desert. They have the whole system lock, right? Now for the system being to carry the Caribbean. The 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 branding well, in Jamaica you have Jaipro. They work a lot in the industry to help people to brand their products and their methods and so forth. So yeah, that's a that's a very important part of the industry. That's a very important part of the industry because you see that Europeans, especially out of Amsterdam, they went all over the world and collect cultivars and claim it to be their own, which can be indigenous to them. These are some of the things. This is just like how we are sent back, we are getting back some of the artifacts of Africa. We have to get back some of the plants and, and fauna and medicines. You know what I'm saying? Are uh, unique to us. So that's another important thing. Right the intellectual property right. Yeah, I know Dr. Marshall has been doing work trying to get back certain um strains that have been lost um to to time in Jamaica. Right. But you need to be a national it have to be a national national and private sector. So privately, yeah, I'm gonna hold on to all of my strains. But nationally you need to recognize because you don't have the same disadvantage again. That people who have the money and can register my strain are gonna register my strain and then we reap the benefit. So you still have to have the balance. That's why traditional knowledge and science and technology for commercialization have to be the way. We must produce access benefit sharing. So if you come to if you come into the, the, the maroon village and you collect strains, we must have access. We must benefit and there must be a sharing between both both of us. So we have to have priority act, um, consent form. We have to use the models that is used by the United Nations conservation for nature. 
because cannabis is a plant. Katie, yeah, as we as we begin to to wind down here, you have given us given us a lot to consider, not just things that need to be done in Jamaica, but also on the on the wider region. And I think a lot of our listeners, advocates, educators who are tuning in, they will be taking notes because a lot of the things that you have shared, some of it is persons usually pick a side. Some persons want to focus simply on the traditional aspect. Some persons want to focus on the technological aspect. Some persons just want to focus nationally and forget um, the wider region or internationally. All of this is things that must be considered if you truly want to develop a holistic industry where not just those who have the capital benefit, but those who have been on any grassroots level from decades ago doing the work that needs to also catch up um, through investment and education. So in closing, is there like any piece of advice that you would like to leave um, specifically with um, our listeners? Get on the blockchain, cannabis people. That's all I can say. Get on the blockchain, understand the technology, get with the AI, understand the technology, because we don't know how to dig a hole. We don't know how to drop a seed. We know how to pick a plant. You understand? Let's get to the other thing. The only thing decentralize our knowledge. That's what you're doing. Decentralize our knowledge. Build a blockchain around the entire industry. Our block different blockchain. We do different things. Incorporate existing blockchain. After start to do some more reading on on blockchain and crypto, uh, it's keep on popping up. I've listened to a few conversations about it. But yeah, I really need to up my, my knowledge yeah. with um with blockchain and crypto because this is where the world is looking there. The the world is heading away from simply cash going into that that AI space metaverse because, and all these different things. Because you know, when we just started it was the internet. Then you have the internet of information. First time internet we could have only connect, two colleges connect. Then you have the information where everybody can find every information. And then we can actually interact like how me and I interact. That is the 2.0. Now we are going to the 3, the web 2.0. It is going to be run by the blockchain technology. I know. Facebook near Meta. Yeah, they, they were saying they, they changed into the metaverse, so everything is a virtual platform now. Exactly. It's a virtual platform now. So listen now. Get on board. Plant guns in the metaverse. Anything you can do, you never used to can do in the real world. But endorse the technology so we can use it to decentralize. So we can raise capital. We can use the technology to grow better plants. We can have more science and research out of it. We need to research more. We need to do our own research. We don't need to start over again. We accept other countries and other tribe research but we need to do we need to research ourselves tell our own Correct. stories that's the important part it's always about telling our own stories because everybody will have their own experiences but your experience will always be your experience and that's what makes you unique so i, I totally agree there that's what makes the world so beautiful so we have to get the technology get on the technology everybody in the caribbean know how to grow cannabis without soil and hydroponics know how to grow it. You just have an idea, take advantage of the laws that are made, the five plant, the two ounce. Um understand micro dosing. You understand? Come off of the smoking, micro dose, know how to make your own medicines. Use your traditional knowledge. You have respect for them. Put it out in your brand them, sell them commercially, stand put standards to them. And let's get rocking in the twenty first century. Because we have Vision twenty thirty. And if we are not there with cannabis, which is the last resort, the last resource of earth, we mind the goal already, mind it. But it's something that can grow over yeah. and over. It's good for the, good for the earth. It, it removes some of the, you know, some of the, exactly. So let us use the science and technology of the Caribbean to connect each other and to develop the industry and to break down barriers and to Ah, the truth. Always. It's only the truth we think or the truth is what does prevail. Kate, Kate, I, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to actually join us here on the Caribbean Cannabis Channel. It has been inspirational, educational, and given us a lot of things to consider, things to work on. And I, I look forward to seeing what you as an individual, as what you do with your community in terms of developing the cannabis space on an international level. 
And I look forward to having um, further conversations with you and persons such as yourself as the cannabis economy continuously grow, pun intended, <laughs> across the, the region. Okay, thank you. Bye. Hi, give thanks for listening to another episode of the Caribbean Cannabis Channel. Be sure to like, share and follow to stay up to date with all the development and behind the scenes happening across the Caribbean cannabis community. Until next time, remember to meditate and educate.